So breaking down a CNN. So for the most part, a CNN is just a regular deep neural network with uh, a few things added. Uh, the two main things are going to be your convolutional layers and your max pooling layers. Uh, and we'll go pretty deep into those. Uh, input and output layer are essentially the same as a deep neural network. Your vanilla tabular data uh, feed forward network. And then you will have your fully connected events layer, which is just like the hidden layers on uh, a feed forward network applied to a tabular data problem. So I'm not going to go too deep into the input layers. You know, we talked about that plenty. Um, it's just going to have the shape of your data. It's going to be normally conventionally uh, three by the width by the height, and that's the normal dimensional ordering. But you know, different frameworks from Torch to Theano to TensorFlow will, I think, all three of those do it differently. Um, so you're just going to have to, you know, pay attention to the way your framework handles dimensionality. Okay, so convolution. Um, convolution is a general uh, mathematical operation that has its origins. I think it first appeared in the late 1700s, so 18th century. Um, and, you know, with a lot of these mathematical concepts, when they're created, you know, uh, the people who discover or solve them, very rarely see application for these abstract mathematical ideas, but, you know, a hundred years passes and they, they find use to a degree that, you know, no one would have imagined. This is the case in cryptography, this is the case in uh, signal processing, it's the case in a lot of areas where, you know, very abstract, very uh, fringe niche mathematics ended up being very important to um, large-scale infrastructure. So below is just the formal definition. Essentially what um, a convolution does is it tells you how one function is modified by another. Um, and at a high level that's you know completely true. You will get an output of a waveform encapsulating that modification. Um, and to just quickly go through that, what's happening is we have two functions, f and g. Um, those are inputs. We take the integral of between the functions with one transpose. So as I hope you remember, transposition is simply just uh, flipping the dimensionality of uh, our data. When it's three dimensions, that gets you know only linearly more complex, but you know it's more to think about and keep in your head. Um, that is what a convolution is doing. It's showing the modification between two functions and how one modifies the other. So one important note is the convolutional kernels inside of CNN are actually not doing convolution. Um, they are doing a very similar thing, essentially the same exact thing, um, except uh, in one of the transformations, we don't have a function reversal, so we're not doing a transposition of the function um, in the cross-correlation of one of the functions. Um, that's essentially the only difference. Convolutional is sort of a misnomer by uh, that measure, um, but you know, cross-correlation network doesn't sound too great. Um, but just remember, uh, fundamentally, we performing a cross-correlation on the image data, we're not doing a convolution. Um, and these layers exist in 2D and 3D variants, depending on you know, the composition of your problem. Uh, you could probably mostly work with 2D, but you know, there are uh, a variety of uses for 3D. Uh, they're very useful in you know, medical diagnoses based on uh, you know, full body scans or uh, medical imaging. Uh, from which you have some sort of three-dimensional um, image or scan that you're trying to classify uh, to diagnose, say, disease, for example. So two important things to know about the convolutional layers are stride and padding. Um, these will change your data in subtle ways. So a stride in a convolutional layer just denotes how the layer convolves around an output, or sorry, an input. Um, and padding will just um, be used to retain the original dimensionality. So let's say you use a stride of one and 
a pool of 3 by 3 that is going to um, reduce your real dimensionality that the neural network is focused on. All padding does is pads out um, the pixels or since this is being modeled as a matrix, uh, the empty cells in a matrix, um, to retain the original dimensionality. Okay, so max pooling. Uh, this is an interesting concept. A lot of people don't necessarily like it because um, you are losing data, right? Uh, by doing max pooling, you inevitably will lose features um, and the information contained in those features just by, um, you know, the nature of the algorithm itself. Uh, you know, we're pooling, you know, a bunch of cells or pixels in our matrix uh, together and taking the mean or the max over them, depending on your problem. And max pooling will obviously take the max, but uh, there there is uh, pooling layers where you will take the mean. Um, and those will be used in specific problems, but for the most part, you will use max pooling almost 100% um, of the time. Um, another reason you know, people don't really like max pooling is um, because you lose a lot of things like pose and the ability to detect the position of an object in uh, projected three-dimensional space. So one of the uh, contributions of capsule networks is they deal with pose very well, so they're not as um, hurt by uh, spatial transformations. So let's say a reflection or it's an object that's rotated in 3D space. A lot of the time when you're using max pooling with a convolutional neural network, that will end up just screwing over the neural network and it will it will break, right? It will not predict the right thing. You know, just simple transformations, whether it be reflection, whether it be, uh, you know, some sort of hue or um, pixel-wise adjustment. Uh, max pooling can really hurt when you have very fine uh, transformations on your images and you're trying to classify that to the same class because it does belong to the same class. But the major motivation behind it is we reduce complexity. Um, as you can probably imagine, images contain a lot of features and in order to classify them, CNNs learn a lot of features. Um, so it's essentially sort of like dropout for the convolutional layers in that, you know, we're trying to reduce the amount of features and learn only the most important ones to solve the problem. And as I said, uh, this is just combining pixels and computing a max or mean over the pool matrix. So it's just a little uh, diagram of that below. So the fully connected and dense layers, and we'll talk a little bit about flatten as well. Uh, but I'm not going to spend too much time on this. You know, this is, I don't want to say 100% the same, but you can think of them as exactly the same as, you know, the tag the data context um, with respect to hidden layers. Um, so our fully connected or dense layers, those are going to be tacked on at the end of, um, you know, all our pooling and convolutional and flatten layers. Um, and they're going to be doing the higher level uh, interpretation and prediction based off those derived features of the convolutional layers. Um, and as with our tabular problems, the predictions can be in any context, even with regression, although, you know, there's not many uh, cases where you would want to predict a regression value based on an image. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm sure you can think of a few, you know, if you're trying to rate how prominent something is in an image, you might want to you know, user regression metric. Um, you know, if you wanted to, you know, any just arbitrary um, scale of value that you're trying to predict with relation to an image, that's that's where you would use uh, regression. And one important thing to take note of is the flat layer. Uh, 
the convolution layer is obviously looking at 2D and 3D features and it's learned those as well. Um, all the flatten layer is doing is taking our 2D or 3D image feature matrix and flattening that out into a one-dimensional uh, feature matrix. It's pretty simple. Okay, so the output layer, um, you know, it's, it's the same as tabular data. We're only going to have some differences in loss and output activations. Um, and you can play around with activations as in normal tabular problems, although, you know, from what I've learned and from what I've done, ReLU tends to work you know, very well in the vast majority of computer vision problems. You can play around with others, but um, I usually like to just say ReLU and go um, when it comes to CP. Other problems, not so much. I do a little bit more optimization there.